Now, since the Manic Street Preachers formed in the 80s, they've gone on to become one of the biggest bands in the world. But despite the success of recent years, many fans still think back to the days of founder member Richie Edwards when he was with the band. An enigmatic, some would say genius lyricist. Uh, well, he disappeared in, it was 1995, hard to believe. But last year was officially declared presumed dead. Prior to his disappearance, he gave the band a journal of lyrics and his writings. It's these lyrics which form the basis of the new Manic Street Preachers album, Journal for Plague Lovers, due to be released this month. Very intriguing. And I'm delighted to say I'm joined by the Manic's lead singer and guitarist, James Dean Bradfield. James, good morning. How are you? Hello, how are you doing, sir? Not too bad, thank you. Uh, very well, James. I, I've good news for you. I've been dancing around to the album already. Well, gee, I, uh, I didn't realise it was a dance album. <laughs> I didn't either. I Thanks didn't for e- that breaking news. Thank you. <laughs> I didn't either until my daughter ran in <laughs> and said, Dance, Dada. As simple as that. Initial reaction to it sounds almost like a different band. I mean, recognise your voice, your guitar playing, but it's funny how taking his lyrics kind of just give the whole thing a different kind of feel and sound. Um, well, kind of, I think, you know, if you look back to the Holy Bible, um, you know, back then, I, I think one journalist described the Holy Bible as as as, as it sounded as if suddenly the stakes were raised, yeah. and um, and kind of Richie's lyrics had a had a habit of infusing you with something different as a musician. So, I, you know, obviously, I don't know if it sounds like a different band, but it definitely just kind of injects you with a, a different attitude sometimes, and yeah. that does it does affect the music definitely. And of course, almost as punkier. Um, oh, definitely. I mean, kind of, obviously, we, we all came from that kind of background of li- liking, you know, indie punk and post-punk music. Um, and just, I suppose, you know, there's just a more of an angular nature to Richie's words. And, you know, the way I would describe his words is, you know, they're full of intent and no punctuation. <laughs> you know, so kind of, uh, so kind of it, it does affect the way you sing, definitely. Yeah. Um, so tell me a bit about where they came from. It's, it sounds very mysterious. Two weeks before his disappearance, he gave a, a book of these lyrics to Nicky, wasn't it? Um, yeah, I mean, kind of, I think, you know, obviously we've all gone a wee bit older and the timeline is a bit fuzzy in our heads, mm. but it's between... I think it's between five and three weeks before he disappeared yeah. that he gave Nick an original book of lyrics with all collage art inside it and lots of, um, you know, lots of scrawlings and, and basically lots of little bits of art plus about 28 complete lyrics. And then shortly after, he gave myself and Sean uh, slightly different copies of, okay. of the same book. Um, but... You know, in retrospect, it would be easy to look back on this with your Clambo hat on yeah. and say, whoa, wow, that was significant. But at the time, we just thought it was the start of another project. Yeah. You know, at the, at the time, we just thought, wow, there's 28 lyrics in here. You know, yeah. and, and obviously, Nick Ritchie had an intensity, intensity to him at that point. Mm-hmm. And um, we just, I just looked at the lyrics and I thought, wow, this is a, this is a concept album or this is a double album, you know? Yeah. And and then they lay just you looked at them now and again. Well, I assume immediately after his appearance, you would have been reading them to see was there something in this to indicate that you know this was part of a plan on his part. I think initially, you know, when it became apparent that Richie was like you know missing, you yeah. know, not um, um, that we started looking through these books, but it, it became very quickly, you know, apparent that you know that there wasn't any clues in these lyrics mm. except for perhaps some kind of map to the state of his mind, but in terms of a clue as to what had happened, there was nothing in there. And I, I really think, you know, the way you go look at the, these, the, these booklets of or lyrics or journals or diaries or whatever you want to call them, is, is that it was his last creative act with the band. Yeah. You know, that's the way it felt at the time. It didn't feel like the last creative act, but it just felt like him just handing over these lyrics and going, I'm running with the ball again, I can't stop writing, have yeah. these. Well, wow. and then they lay kind of well, not undiscovered, but the, you know the idea of doing that with them didn't cross your mind until very recently. What what made you decide to to revisit them? Um, I think time is the is the simple answer. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I remember when I first started looking at the lyrics when which he gave them to us. I remember thinking that I didn't quite connect with them back then um, because we had just done the Holy Bible, and I didn't feel as if I needed to go on and, and kind of do something that was so internalized. Even though the lyrics are different, they're definitely different to the lyrics in the Holy Bible. Mm. The thing they share in common with them is that they're still very internalized. Yeah. And I'm, I, we just didn't feel as if, well, I didn't feel as if I wanted to carry on with that. I wanted to do something else, which became Everything Must Go at that point. Yeah. Um, but I suppose what, what's made me, what made me initially think that I could start writing music to these was 
very simply that a lot of time had elapsed between then and, and, and now. And um, I, th I remember I was in the back of a car with Nick, Nicky Wire about two years ago, and we were trying to decide what to do next. And I just said to him as an aside, look, I've been looking at Richie's, the book, I've been looking at Richie's lyrics for the first time in ages um, lately, and I've really connected with them. I couldn't stop turning the pages. Yeah. You know, I'd, I'd started having ideas, to, uh, musical ideas to all these lyrics. And um, as soon as I just kind of said that, yeah. and, you know, the idea became, you know, public to myself and Nick, he just, you know, I could just see he just wanted to do it straight away. It was almost like an idea whose time had come. Yeah. But I think it was important that we did it after Send Away the Tigers. I think if we'd have done it after Lifeblood, um, which was our, you know, our, our previous album before Send Away the Tigers, I think if we had done it then, people would have looked at it as a rather cynical thing because people would have thought of it as if we were trying to save our careers or something. Yeah. Whereas after Send Away the Tigers, it was a comeback of sorts for us. You know, Absolutely. Your Love Alone is Not Enough it was a hit around Europe. Yeah. And so I think that made it easier for everybody to understand why we were doing it. Yeah. And when you were saying you'd read the lyrics and they'd give you ideas, I was, I was intrigued by that. Is, that. is that the way it works, that you, when you're reading something, something inside it just suggests how a piece of music can go with this? It does. I mean, uh, I think I've you know, talked to you before about this. You know, um, I'm always singing somebody else's lyrics, you know, yeah. um, whether it be in the past, Richie's or Nick's, or their lyrics together. And so I've always, always realize that my position is slightly strange as being the singer singing somebody else's lyrics yeah um so i've always 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 i always think that the the lyrics must inspire you know the music mm -hmm. you know that's the way it works for me 99 percent of the time yeah. so that didn't change really that's always been the same for me i've always had to sit with a lyric in front of me and they've always had to insp inspire the music for me the music has always had to be relevantly written to the music. Yeah. Um, the big difference being this time is that, can I say if I had, there was a reference in the lyric, which there were plenty, yeah. um, that I didn't quite understand. This time, obviously, I couldn't ask Richie for any clarification. You know? Yeah. Would he have given clarification in the past? <laughs> you know, that's, a, that's kind of a, it's a good question because sometimes, yeah. yes, he would openly just kind of uh, give me a slightly um, charitable look. <laughs> yeah. And then you go, okay, this yeah. means this. <laughs> and then other times he would be a bit more cryptic and he would just yeah. say, no, you just get on with it. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> right. <laughs> God, what a way to work. Um, and you decided also, it's, you know, saying it's kind of punk, you, you steered clear of, of Manic Street Preacher's kind of signature strings and, and stuff. Cause that, is that because it just wouldn't have s sat with this? Oh, there's strings on there twice, Tom. Oh, are there? Uh, yes, oh, there are. Um, oh, in, in very much more understated, yeah. uh, ocean, rain, echo in the bunny man kind of way. Yeah, uh, kind a, of thing. That's a beautiful but, way. Yeah, but um, no, I mean, kind of, I, I got to say, I, I, it's, not a f it's not like a, a follow-up to the Holy Bible. I think it's a, it's a natural conclusion to the Holy Bible. I, I don't think it's the same record. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, where the lyrics on the Holy Bible deal with anger, rage, and disgust, I think, you know, these lyrics are different. I think they, they're a bit more resigned, mm -hmm. um, but also they're a bit more serene. Uh, it's somebody who's just come out of the other end of what was the Holy Bible and has decided that there's just, he doubts everything, but yeah. he's not angry about it. He's much more resigned and much more, and in a strange way, much more serene yeah. kind of about it. So in some places, the album is, is a wee bit more calm. Um, dare I say it, sometimes beautiful. Yeah. But, um, Obviously, there's still that element of of, of the post punk post punk influence that the Holy Bible had. Yeah. But there there are moments of you know calmness. There 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 are three songs on there which have very much more an acoustic feel. Yeah, enjoy them. Um, so you're going to tour this, or how's it going to fit into the great scheme of things? Yes, we are. Um, we're doing a small tour of Britain and Ireland. Um, yeah. uh, I think we play in uh, Belfast and Dublin. And and uh, but I, I think you know I think we're very aware with this record that. You know, when we started writing this, when we started writing the music uh, to, to Richie's lyrics, one of the first rules was was that we were not going to try and write a single. Um, we realised when we were reading these lyrics that this was a this was a, a guy that was not interested in having a hit single at this point in his life. Yeah. And um, so when we wrote the music, we acted accordingly. So, in regards to you know touring this record, I think we. We, we, we understand that we're playing to a, a certain part of our audience. Yeah. We're not pretending that this is going to sell a million records. Yeah. You know, this is very much, you know, 
we, I think we were facing up to the responsibility of using the lyrics that Richie left us and doing him justice yeah. and, you know, obviously enjoying almost being a four-piece again yeah. and then realizing that, like, you know, this isn't for the entire world, this is for a certain part of the audience. So it's, it's, small, it's a small tour. Yeah. I got Richie back in the room with you. That's yes, fair. no, it was kind of, it definitely brought a balance back to the force, shall we say. Yeah, very good. Um, I'm going to take a track from it now. Um, Jackie Collins, Existential Question Time. Man, she features scourge of DJs everywhere. <laughs> when you have a title like that, it can only be the lyrics from one man. Can't it? <laughs> <laughs> Spectacular. But listen, uh, James, great talking to you. Um, the gig in the Olympia is June the 4th. So I hope I might get down to see that. And I hope all is well with you, James. Cheers, Tom. Take Lovely talking to you. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Uh, from the Man Who Preaches, the brand new album. This is a uh, journal for plague lovers. And from it, this is, what a title, Jackie Collins, Existential Question Time.